Hi everyone. In the last three lectures, we've been studying the crystalline structures in solids, presuming that these structures are perfect or have no defects. Actually, this is not the case in the real world. Everything has defects. Likewise, metals and alloys do. They do have defects. They do have division from their perfect structures. Therefore, the coming, uh, the coming three lectures uh, is for studying the division from the perfect structure in solids uh, or the defects, uh, the most important defects in solids. The atomic arrangement in solids uh, always has imperfections or defects. Uh, the most important uh, defects uh, in solids uh, are point defects uh, line defects or dislocations and surface defects actually the material with these with these kind of defects or uh, possibly other uh, other kind of defects is not defective from their uh, technological point of view furthermore we can control some physical and mechanical properties by adjusting these the amount of these uh, um, defects for example, uh, iron is inherently soft, uh, pure iron is inherently soft, uh, but by introducing carbon to it, we can produce uh, a steel with high, um, uh, with high mechanical properties uh, um, like, strength, uh, um, like strength and other mechanical properties. However, this is not, the, is not always the case uh, in all applications. Uh, for example, the electrical conductivity of copper increases significantly by increasing the number of point defects. Those for this particular application, we need, we definitely need to reduce the point defects as much as possible. Starting with point defects, vacancies is the simplest sort of point defects. Vacancies means a vacant lattice position or vacant, vacant lattice site or unoccupied lattice site, which is a, a lattice site with missing atom. There is no atom here in this lattice site. Actually, this kind of, uh, actually, uh, it is impossible to uh, produce a, a solid without these sort of defects. And this can be explained in light of uh, the second law in thermodynamics, uh, which states uh, that every single, um, every isolated system uh, it tends to increase uh, its randomness or its um, uh, entropy. Uh, to be more stable, to, to be more thermodynamically stable. Uh, those having uh, these different, uh, these kind of defects, uh, as it um, as it uh, uh, fulfills this condition or fulfill the second um, uh, the second law in thermodynamics uh, by increasing the entropy of the system. You can imagine that having like this uh, like this, uh, this defects. Uh, definitely increase the entropy of the, uh, of the system. Those, the, the, uh, the system, the solid, uh, the solid with, with this kind of defects uh, will be more, uh, will be uh, more thermodynamically stable by increasing the uh, entropy of, uh, of it. The, uh, the equilibrium number of vacancies uh, N sub V for a given volume of material, usually uh, per cubic meter, uh, can be determined by using this equation, where N is the total is the total number of atomic sites per cubic meter, no matter these um, these sites are occupied or empty. Q Q sub V is the energy required for the formation of vacancy. And as any, um, um, any energy, it can be given by joule per mole or electron volt per atom. 
T is the absolute temperature and K is Boltzmann constant. Boltzmann constant. As we can observe the formula, uh, as, uh, as we can uh, um, uh, observe uh, from the uh, from this equation uh, that the equilibrium number of vacancies uh, uh, increases exponentially with temperature. The number, of the total number of vacancies, the equilibrium number of vacancies increases exponentially with temperature. With an increasing temperature, the, uh, the, the total number of vacancies, the equilibrium number of vacancies, uh, increases exponentially. And here I, I put an example for this. The ratio n sub v over n, n sub v over n, just below the melting temperature uh, uh, in order of 10 to 4. That is, one site one atomic site out of 10,000 sites is empty, close to the melting temperature. So we can imagine the uh, large number of vacancies in the material by looking at this, uh, at this equation and by looking at this, um, uh, at this example. Here is an example that shows us how to determine uh, NV or the equilibrium number of vacancies uh, for a given material. The example, the example says, calculate the equilibrium number of vacancies per cubic meter for kappa at 1000 degrees Celsius. The energy of vacancy formation is 0.8 electron volt per atom. The atomic weight and density at 1000 degrees Celsius for kappa are 63.5 gram per mole and 8.4 gram per centimeter square respectively. Uh, now to calculate n sub v, we need, uh, we need uh, to determine n first. n is the total number of uh, atomic sites. But in the, in, the, uh, in the question, there is no uh, like this number. So we need to calculate it. And we can do so by using the atomic weight, the density of the material, and the Avogadro number by follow this equation. N equals Avogadro number times the density of the material divided by the atomic weight. Those Avogadro number is here in, atom, in atoms per mole times the density of the material from the equation, from the equation, the density of the material 8.4 gram per centimeter cubic. But here we need to be careful because the n has to be atoms per meter cubic, not uh, per centimeter cubic. So we need to convert centimeter to uh, to meter by dividing this uh, by, by by multiplying this quantity uh, by uh, 10 to 6. Now, gram here goes with a gram here, mole here goes with mole here, and finally we will get this number 8 times uh, 10 to uh, 18 atoms per meter cubic. It's 8 times 10 to 18, so we can imagine how big is, the, uh, how big is this number which is the total number of uh, atomic sites in the, uh, in the material, in the given volume of the material. By using the, uh, the equation in the last, uh, in the, from the last slide, we can uh, determine n sub v directly. This is the total number that we just determined, the total number of uh, atomic sites times the exponential of uh, uh, the, the energy required uh, for the formation of the vacancy in electron volt. Uh, Boltzmann constant is here uh, in electron volt per, per Kelvin and uh, the, uh, the temperature the, uh, uh, the, uh, the temperature that given in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the question but we need to convert it to, um, uh, to absolute temperature in Kelvin. Here it is in, 
and degree Celsius. We need to convert it to, uh, um, uh, to Kelvin. And uh, in this equation, Kelvin goes with Kelvin, electron volt goes with electron volt, and the total unit of the of NV is vacancy per meter square. It's atom per meter square, but, but because we are determining the number of vacancies, it is vacancies <coughs> per meter uh, per meter cubic. Now, by dividing the number uh, the the number of uh, vacancies uh, in the given material by the total number of at, uh, atomic sites, uh, we will get 2.7 times 10 to four, um, uh, 10 to minus 4. The temperature, the melting temperature of copper is 1,083. Uh, it is close to the to the uh, to the equation temperature, but it is not very close. Those the, the number the number of um, the ratio this ratio is 2.7 times 10 to um, uh, minus 4 is not 1 uh, times 10 to minus. But with an increasing the temperature to be very close to 1,000. Uh, 38, this number increases exponentially. Another source of uh, point defects is impurities. And actually, it is, it is quite challenging to have any material without impurities or material with the same type of atoms. Even by using a very sophisticated refining uh, metal uh, methods, uh, it, is, it is very difficult to get uh, uh, the purity 99.49 or what is called 49s uh, impurity. And even with this impurity, we can, uh, we, we still have uh, 10 to 22 to 10 to 23 impurities or number of impurity atoms in one meter cubic of material. Those impurity does exist in material in, in all metals, in all metals and alloys. But the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the percent of them uh, depends on the refining method and the refining, and the refining process. Another type of uh, point defects uh, is interstitial defects. Uh, and in this type, uh, the uh, foreign atoms uh, goes in the interstitial sites in the lattice. It doesn't go to the normal size or um, the normal site in the lattice. And instead, it goes to the interstitial sites. Interstitial, for example, this atom um, um, uh, locate itself in the interstitial um, sites in this lattice. And whatever the size of this atom, it causes distortion to the lattice. The, distor the uh, distortion to the lattice uh, um, um, uh, comes from the difference in the size uh, between the lattice uh, between the um, uh, the interstitial size the interstitial site and the uh, and the foreign atoms uh, size. Even with hydrogen, which is the smallest uh, uh, smallest possible atom. Uh, this kind of MPM, this kind of uh, defects, and this kind of interstitial atom uh, causes this, uh, this uh, um, uh, distortion of the lattice. Uh, Sometimes we introduce this kind of, um, uh, um, of defects uh, to improve the mechanical property. For example, uh, a small amount of carbon is added to ion to increase mechanical properties uh, as we uh, as we've seen previously and actually in this case uh, uh, carbon atoms goes into interstitial uh, sites in the uh, lattice of uh, ion causing this uh, causing a distortion of the uh, lattice and uh, strengthening of the material strengthening of the mechanical properties increasing the mechanical properties this kind of defects uh, is different from vacancies. Uh, while vacancies uh, increases with temperature, this kind of defects does not depend on temperature. 
substitutional defects on the other hand is another kind of point defects but in this type of the de of defects or point defects the impu the impurity atoms or the uh, foreign atoms goes into a normal size in the lattice here or here in this example or in this example the foreign atom goes into the normal sites and the normal normal atomic sites uh, in the uh, um, in the lattice and in um, uh, the foreign atoms uh, is either larger of the uh, larger than the uh, native atoms or smaller than the native atoms in both cases it causes disruption of the lattice in the first case when the uh, impurity atom or the foreign atom um, is larger than the, no, the, the native atoms it causes compression or a small um, or it causes smaller um, atomic spacing uh, in the atoms surrounding it if it is smaller than the, uh, than the normal atom, than the normal native atoms, uh, it causes uh, tension uh, or uh, increasing the spacing of the uh, space is uh, interatomic spacing of the surrounding atoms. Uh, these um, these kind of uh, uh, defects uh, can be um, can, uh, can be uh, exist. Um, as impurity or we can add it as um, uh, as alloying elements uh, though um, um, we can add, um, intention we can add it intentionally or deliberately to uh, um, to control the mechanical properties of the uh, of the metal on alloy as, as you see uh, in the both cases uh, there's a disruption of the lattice of the lattice uh, and this causes a strengthening of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the metal and the alloy yeah um, uh, and uh, uh, as uh, uh, um, um, as as an interstitial defects uh, substitutional defects uh, does not depend uh, on temperature So far, we studied the uh, point defects in metals and alloys. And in summary, the most important point defects in metals and alloys are vacancies, impurities, interstitial defects, and substitutional defects. Now we need to study the other kind of, uh, of defects, the other type of defects, uh, which is linear defects or dislocations. This kind of, um, uh, of defects uh, uh, has an extremely um, 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 important effects uh, on uh, on the uh, on the mechanical behavior of the uh, metals and alloys. In particular, uh, the plastic deformation of the uh, alloy, or explanation of a plastic deformation of uh, this kind of material. Dislocation uh, simply is an extra half plane inserted in a lattice to break its perfection those it is extra again it is extra half plane inserted in the lattice and um, because it is extra extra plane of extra plane of of atoms it causes distortion of the uh, lattice and as you can see here, the, uh, the upper portion of the lattice uh, where the dislocation located uh, is uh, compressed. The distance between the uh, atoms or interatomic distance uh, is squeezed. And the lower portion of the lattice uh, is, uh, is under tensile um, uh, stress or the interatomic distance between atoms, the interatomic distance or the distance between atom, uh, atoms is, uh, is pulled. Um, uh, the, those, the, the, this kind of defects introduce uh, imperfection to the lattice in this way. Um, the dislocation 
the dislocation, the dislocation uh, uh, may, uh, may be uh, may be exist in the upper part of the uh, upper part uh, upper part of the portion, as uh, in our example here. And in this um, uh, in this way, it's called uh, um, positive edge dislocation. Or it is um, it, it is possible to be in the lower part of the of the uh, lattice, and in this case it's called negative um, edge dislocation. And we always use uh, this symbol uh, to uh, designate the positive uh, edge dislocation. And we use this um, this symbol to um, to designate the, the the negative edge dislocation. Dislocation is defined by uh, the uh, core of dislocation, which is the uh, the point where the uh, the extra uh, plane of atom is terminated. The extra plane of atoms here. It's terminate, it is terminated here, and this is called um, uh, the core of dislocation. We also use uh, the line of dislocation or dislocation line to define the, uh, uh, to define the dislocation. Uh, this uh, dislocation line represents the, uh, the line that goes through the dislocation, um, the, the extra uh, half a plane or the extra plane of atoms. Because the dislocation line here is that line, that line, that line here. Core of this dislocation, dislocation core is here, dislocation line is here. And we also need what is called Berger's vector to totally define the dislocation. Uh, Berger's vector can be identified by moving uh, around the dislocation core. Let's do, well, let's do this and see what's going to happen. If we start moving from here um, into clockwise direction, uh, let's say for two interatomic spacing, we will, we will see something like this. Now we started from here and move two interatomic spacing, one, two, and then we are still moving around the dislocation core, one, two, and to complete our uh, um, uh, moving, we need to jump here, one, two, and then one, two. So we end at this point, while we started at this point. The end point, the end point is not the same as the starting point. And the vector that connected the end point to the start point is called Berger's vector. Again, we need to move around the dislocation core and connect the the end point, we need to move them around the dislocation line in a clockwise direction and connect the end point to the starting point in what is called Berger's vector. So the dislocation, defined, the dislocation defines by dislocation line, dislocation core, and Berger's vector. Uh, this is for uh, this for a positive uh, this uh, positive edge dislocation. We can uh, we can do the same for uh, negative edge dislocation and moving around the dislocation so that the, the, the Berger's vector will be on uh, uh, on the opposite direction. Micro dislocation is another kind of uh, dislocations. Uh, and it can be um, visualized by uh, applying shear stress to uh, this crystal, moving the upper portion of it uh, uh, one atomic distance to the uh, to the right. Those uh, the imperfection created here is called screw dislocation. Screw dislocation uh, can be uh, can be positive screw dislocation as we can see here, or it can be negative screw dislocation if the upper part of the upper portion of the crystal moves to the uh, to the left or in the opposite direction. 
Sucrose dislocation has the same characteristic, uh, characteristic uh, of uh, the edge dislocation. So it has the core of dislocation, which is here, and it has uh, the line, the dislocation line, uh, which identify for sucrose dislocation in, uh, in, uh, at this line. So the sucrose dislocation line is different from the, um, the edge dislocation. It is something like this. This is the sucrose dislocation line. And to, um, uh, to identify um, uh, Berger's vector, we need to move around the, um, uh, around the dislocation core and uh, connect the end point to the starting point. Those, if we move around the dislocation line, we need to connect connect the end point, which is here, to the, um, to the starting point, um, which is here. Actually, in the last slide, uh, uh, I mentioned that we need to move uh, into, um, uh, in, uh, onto a clockwise direction, but, uh, but, uh, but this, this doesn't matter. We can move around the dislocation uh, in, uh, in whatever direction we need. But I mentioned a clockwise direction to me uh, to make it easier for you to grasp it. Those moving around the dislocation core in any direction will give them, will, will give, a, uh, give us the, um, the Berger's vector. And as you remember from our previous lectures, uh, that the, uh, in crystallographic definition, uh, that the, uh, the, the, the opposite directions uh, are the same direction. Those Berger's vector here, Berger, uh, Berger's vector here is exactly the same uh, if the Berger's vector started from, uh, from uh, end point here and end, uh, ends at the starting point here. So the, the two opposite directions are the same. Uh, for uh, for sucrose dislocation, as you can see here, Berger vector, Berger's vector is parallel to sucrose uh, uh, dislocation line, while it was uh, perpendicular to um, um, to the um, dislocation line and edge dislocation, and this is the most important difference between the sucrose dislocation and uh, um, uh, and edge dislocation. Again, the Berger's vector, Berger's vector is parallel to the dislocation line and sucrose dislocation, while it is perpendicular to dislocation line and, uh, and uh, edge dislocation. It is highly likely to have something in between, um, uh, between the edge dislocation and sucrose dislocation, which is called mixed dislocation. And in, in, the, in the figure here, the, uh, the, uh, this face uh, has a pure edge dislocation, while this face uh, has a, a, a pure sucrose dislocation. And in between these two, fa the two faces, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, what's called a mixed dislocation. Uh, mixed dislocation. Uh, here, for, for edge dislocation, Berger's vector is, um, uh, is perpendicular to the dislocation line. For sucrose dislocation, Berger's vector is parallel to the um, dislocation line. While for mixed dislocation, which is in between these two kinds of, them, uh, of dislocations, uh, Berger's vector is neither parallel nor um, uh, perpendicular to the dislocation line. It is something in between. And uh, the most, uh, the highly likely uh, kind of dislocation in metals and alloys uh, is mixed dislocation, which connected the edge dislocation to sucrose dislocation. However, the Berger's vector for, uh, for this kind of dislocation is the same. Berger's vector for sucrose dislocation is the same as Berger's vector of um, edge dislocation. And it, it is the same uh, for mixed dislocation for the same for the same um, uh, the same combination of uh, uh, of dislocations. I mean.
if we got mixed dislocation we uh, we do have a sucro dislocation and we do have um, an edge dislocation and Berger's vector for uh, for these through uh, for these three dislocations uh, is the same We already went through the, uh, the explanation of Berger's vector and its relation to uh, the dislocation line. And as we said previously, Berger's vector is parallel to uh, dislocation line and sucro dislocation, while it is perpendicular to dislocation line and sucro dislocation. It is neither um, perpendicular nor um, parallel to dislocation line and mixed dislocation. We already went through the explanation in this slide, but I want to, uh, I'd like to um, uh, stress that uh, the the dislocation um, um, to this uh, to, to this um, uh, point here, the dislocation are introduced in, ma in materials due to solidification or during the solidification. So when we solidify a melting metal, we we already introduce so introduce dislocation. When we do some plastic deformation, some um, uh, some metal forming like forging or uh, or any kind of forming uh, on the metals and alloys, actually we introduce a new dislocations. When we do some heat treatment, uh, for example, rapid uh, rapid cooling uh, or um, high rate high rate cooling, uh, where in heat treatment uh, we raise the temperature of the metal, uh, holding it at this temperature at this high temperature for uh, some time, and then cooling it. If we introduce, if we cool, um, if the cooling rate is is uh, is quite high, we uh, actually we uh, uh, introduce a new dislocation. And at this point, uh, we, we reach the, the end of uh, this um, uh, lecture. Thank you very much.